Adhikarna 7. No Restriction of Place. Sutra 11. Yatra Kagrata Tatra Visheshat. Yatra, wherever Ekagrata, concentration, is possible. Tatra, there one should meditate. Avisheshat, because of the absence of specification. Translation. Meditation is to be undertaken wherever the mind gets concentrated because there is no specification. The doubt arises about the direction, place, and time as to whether there is any regulation about them or not. Now, somebody may think that since in the Vedic rites the directions, etc., are noticed to be well determined, the case must be similar here as well. The answer of the Vedantin to such a one is being given. The regulation about direction, place, and time is concerned only with that much regarding them as conducive to meditativeness. One should meditate facing any direction, in any place, at any time, that leads to one's concentration of mind easily. Unlike the regulations fixing the eastern direction, forenoon, and a place sloping down to the east, and so on, as met with in the cases of rites, no such specific regulation is mentioned in the Upanishads. While the one thing desirable is that one should always have concentration of mind while engaged in upasana. Opponent. Some Upanishads prescribe even specific rules, as in, one should concentrate one's mind on the Supreme Self by taking shelter in a windless cave or other such places as are level and clean, free from pebbles, fire, and sand, free from noise, remote from busy places like water ponds or public sheds, and at the same time pleasing to the mind but not oppressive to the eyes. Svetashvatara Upanishad 2.10 Vedantin True, there are directions like that. But taking for granted these directions, the aphorist advises like a friend that with regard to the details of these matters, there is no hard and fast rule. And the phrase pleasing to the mind in the above quotation only shows that the place can be anywhere that is conducive to concentration. Adhikarana 8. Meditation till death. Doubt. Under the first topic, it was established that repetition is to be welcomed in all cases of contemplation. Among them, these contemplations that are meant for complete enlightenment can well be understood to have a limit to their repetition, inasmuch as they end with the object aimed at, as is seen in the process of husking paddy, which stops with producing rice. When the result, consisting in full enlightenment, is achieved, no other effort can be prescribed, since a man goes beyond the domain of scripture when he realizes the oneness of the self with Brahman. But with regard to those meditations which have in view some fruit of the nature of secular prosperity, this doubt arises. Should one stop after revolving the idea in one's mind for a certain time? Or should one do so for life? What would be the conclusion then? Opponent one should give up the meditation after revolving the idea in one's mind for a certain time, since thereby is fulfilled the requirement of the texts enjoining the practice of repeated meditation. Vedantin. This being the position, we say, Sutra 11, Aprayanatatrapi hidrishtam Aprayanat up till the moment of death, he, for, tatra api, even then, drishtam, it is seen, to happen in the scripture. Translation, meditation is to be repeated up till the moment of death, for it is noticed in the scriptures that it is done so even then. One shall contemplate on the idea repeatedly till the moment of death, because the acquisition of the unseen potential result of action is dependent on the final contemplation of the idea. 
For even the fruits of past actions which are destined to produce a result enjoyable in a subsequent birth arouse at the time of death a pattern of consciousness replete with the thoughts conforming to that, as is known from such Upanishadic texts as, Then the soul has consciousness of the fruits in the form of impressions that it has to experience, and it goes to the next body which is the fruit associated with that consciousness. Brihararanyaka 4.4.2 Together with whatever world, that is, result of action, he had in mind at the time of death, he enters into prana, prana in combination with udana and in association with the soul, leads him to the world desired by him. Prashnopanishad 3.10 This is so also because of the illustration of grass and a leech. Brihararanyaka 443. What other pattern of consciousness can these ideas have at the time of death apart from their repetition just as they are? Hence, those ideas are to be revolved in the mind till death, which are nothing but a contemplation of that very result which is to be achieved. Thus it is that a Vedic text shows the repetition of the idea at the time of death. The resolves with which that man departs from this world. Shatapata Brahmana 10.6.3.1 To this effect occurs the Smriti passage also. Remembering whatever object at the end he leaves his body, that alone is reached by him, O son of Kunti, because of his constant thought of that. Gita 8.6 At the time of death, with the mind unmoving, Gita 8.10. And he shall think of these three at the time of death, Chandogyopanishad 3.17.6, shows the last duty that remains to be done at the time of death. Namaste. So the first Adhikarana here is about where to meditate. Basically, anywhere that suits you. Of course, it's nice if you have a quiet place, a clean place, a safe place, somewhere where you have reasonable certainty you will not be interrupted. Because, as studies in software development and other creative arts have shown, if there is even a probability of being interrupted, there are certain levels of tasks that you will not take up. Why? Because why should I get started if I'm just going to be interrupted? And then I have to load the whole task into, you know, short-term memory all over again and restart my creative process and try to get into flow again. Oh, I'm just, you know, I'm not even going to start. So you really need to have the assurance that you will not be interrupted during your planned, you know, period of meditation. And that can mean going out into the woods or to an abandoned house or other place like that. Or what I've done is I just created a soundproof room. <laughs> it's also my studio, yeah, but it's great for meditation. And Everything that's connected to the internet or the phone or everything is outside, so I won't get interrupted. That's about all I have to say about that one. The next Adhikarana is really important because it brings out the truth that one should meditate until leaving the body. Why? Because, as the Bhagavad Gita says, yam yang vapi smaran bhavam, that state of being that you remember while quitting the body, you are certain to attain in the next life. There is going to be a next life, even if it's in Brahma Loka. And the rest of the fourth chapter is about describing all of that, how the soul transmigrates from one body to another, the difference between the enlightened and unenlightened being and how they die and where they go after they die and so on. 
And finally, the ultimate result of perfect enlightenment. So that's what you have to look forward to in this chapter. But in this Adhikarana, he brings out and emphasizes the principle that whatever you want to become in your next life should be the subject of your meditations now. So, see, this goes back to bhakti. You know, a lot of people think that Brahman, realizing Brahman means that you become like nothing. <laughs> and that's just not true. No, you will have a body, you will have an individuality, but it won't be here. It won't be, you know, earth in Kali Yuga. <laughs> Yuck. No, it'll be in the pure creation, in the Brahma Loka, where Shiva and Shakti reside, and all of their close devotees. Huh? So this is something to really look forward to. But going back to bhakti and spontaneous bhakti means to realize what kind of relationship you want with them. What kind of role do you want to play in their pastimes? And what kind of specific pastimes do you want to have with them? So this can get extremely specific. And in our studies of uh, the Nectar of Devotion, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, we talked about rasa. And basically there are five kinds of relationships. Neutrality, servitorship, parenthood, friendship, and conjugal love. So yes, you could become a lover of God. You can become one of the intimate companions of God in any form uh, and there are unlimited forms. Now, if you've done your homework, if you've done your sadhana, if you have lived a pure life and followed the instructions of the Vedas and so on, you become attractive to God. And God will appear to you, will manifest in your life, God or goddess or both, in different ways. It happened to me starting back in like 1975. I started getting visits, darshans, from, actually it turned out to be Shiva, in the form of a lion. This is still going on, because this is your swarup, nitya swarup, your eternal, actual self, your eternal identity and your relationship with the Absolute. So, this will manifest spontaneously. Not that you have to sit there and concentrate and think about it. See? That's the wrong approach. That will just lead to a fall down because it won't lead to any satisfaction. However, as my Adi Guru used to say, if you become such that God wants to see you, huh? You don't have to strive to see God. God will come and become visible to you, become manifest to you. God and or goddess. Uh -huh. So one's relationship with the Supreme begins with the Saguna Brahma, God in form. And then it progresses over a long period of time to the relationship with the formless, Nirguna Brahman. But you will see in the rest of this chapter that really the expectation is that you will realize Saguna Brahman and go to Brahma Loka, and there you will live for the rest of the duration of the universe, which is quite a long time, hundreds of billions of years in an ideal form that is just perfect for you, that relationship with the Supreme in that form is completely satisfying. Unlike this earthly existence, which is, you know, full of so much dissatisfaction, 
It's unsatisfying because the material world is temporary. It's unsatisfactory by nature because it's not the self. Whereas when you're in relationship with God, he is the self. He knows you. He made you just the way he wanted you for some specific service, some specific purpose that may not be revealed until you actually get to the spiritual world or get to Brahma Loka. That's all right. But you have to have the trust that even though from our point of view here, it's hard to imagine what that would be like. Yet, if you do your sadhana properly, it will be revealed to you spontaneously by God himself, God or goddess, or both. So, you see, faith is an intrinsic part of enlightenment, even in a dvaita. Why did Shankaracharya establish so many temples of gods and goddesses? And why did he write the Archanapaditi, which is the standard of uh, service in those temples? And why did he write so many amazingly wonderful devotional prayers to be chanted in those temples? You know, he's not doing it uh, just to please the common man, but rather to give them the preliminary stages of self-realization so that when they finally are ready, they can realize Brahman and attain the highest. And so the rest of the Adhikaranas in this pada and the next three padas of this chapter are going to discuss all these things in tremendous detail, after which you will have no more doubts as to what is going to happen at the time of death and after death to you. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shati Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.